Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show, where ordinary heroes tell extraordinary stories during unique and never been heard before conversations with your host, Hillary Arno Burns. Hillary's unique listening and way of asking questions results in conversations that aren't usually talked about. So you can create the life that you really want, but are afraid you can't really have. We are demonstrating the greatness and the human spirit in creating a world where we all reclaim our birthright of joy, happiness, purpose, and passion. Now, here's your host, Hilary Arno Burns. Welcome to the Getting Real with Hillary show. And as always, we have a very special guest. Um, today's guest is John Houston, and he's going to talk about something that we definitely have not had on the show before. John has a very uh, interesting and compelling background and what he's doing. Well, I'm not even going to tell you who he's doing it for, but I'm going to let him tell you his story. Um, he's a very special guy to a very special bunch of people. So welcome, John. Hello. Hello. It's nice to have you here. <laughs> well, thank you for having me, Hillary. It's nice to see you. Yes. It's always fun to get in and have some challenges, but here we are because we just keep going, right? So I know, um, all right, so let's talk about, I know you used, I think you used to be in New York City with a big corporate job. And can you tell us a little bit about your background before you launch into your current passion? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm an Englishman who ended up in New York. I was very lucky in London to have a job with a Canadian company that moved me to Toronto and then New York as part of my career pro progression. And uh, in New York, I was working in marketing arena and jumping in planes and flying all over North America as part of my regular routine. And uh, we were in the direct marketing world where, to summarize it in the epiphany that I had while working there, we cut down trees, we put them through letterboxes, and it happened to be profitable. And yet for our clients, we produced amazing results. We were measured very specifically by response rates, which you know exactly what's working and what isn't. So it was very scientific and um, it was a very rewarding job. I loved it. I was a hungry young 30 year old climbing the corporate ladder. And then one day I had an epiphany. We were in a warehouse full of paper. We printed roll to roll. So these stacks of paper looked like toilet rolls stacked up, but they filled the warehouse from floor to ceiling. And it looked like a forest of trees, roll upon roll of paper. And that's where I saw, oh, we cut down trees. We put them through letterboxes and it happens to be profitable. And that inkling along with a, a diagnosis with uh, skin cancer, my doctor asked me, where's your source of stress? And um, I didn't know, I didn't see it. And then he asked me what I did for work and he kind of went, oh, yeah, maybe you should look there. And then I asked, what if I went to be a ski bum and you know worked in a ski resort and the long and the short of the story is i moved from new york city to the west coast of canada where i've lived for the last 25 years and it's here that i've learned a lot about our relationship with nature as human beings and our relationship with each other and I think, you know, what we're about to talk about today is the First Nations people, so the indigenous people of North America. And in the last four years, I've been living up the coast with a First Nations village as my neighbor. And this particular village is in, they, they've actually won um, their land back, 3% of their original land, and now a self-governing nation. But in being a neighbor of theirs, I've learned a lot about the history a lot more than we are taught in school. So right. my corporate so, life has allowed me yeah. to, to listen and be a solution driven person, which isn't necessarily what's needed in this environment. It's listening and allowing your heart to engage and realizing what's actually happening, the truth of what is happening. So. Okay, so, so how did you decide so you're, you're working, 
you have the epiphany, you see the roles, you get a diagnosis of skin cancer and you figure out the stress is from your job. And then how did you decide to be a scheme bum? Like it's very, you know, or, or was a, that always what you wanted to do? Like, how does that happen? No. And then I know, and how did you pick Canada um, to be a ski bum? Or is that, well, yeah, I have the easy, easy answers for you. Like picking Canada was easy because prior to New York, I was in Whistler, uh, sorry, I was in Toronto. Oh, okay. And in Toronto, I had the first scare with cancer. And it cost me $23 for my surgery because we have public health care. And when I was in New York, I had the second scare three within three years. So it's unusual for a 30 year old to have two strikes with a malignant melanoma. And I listened when the doctor said, where's your source of stress? I really didn't get it. I loved my job. I was a young, hungry corporate guy. I had amazing clients, had an amazing boss. I worked for an amazing company. We produced amazing results. It was like, it was like brainstorming around a table with corporate decision makers and they would run with our ideas and they would run with our ideas because they were ideas that were proven to work. And so we just consistently were improving and improving and improving our performance and leaving the competition behind us because they're looking at results from three months ago and we're already working on what's next for the next three months. So we're always ahead of the curve. And so what was I guess the stress? Have, well, I think yeah. when you have monthly deadlines, you don't see the stress. You don't see oh. um, the, the, the damage it's potentially causing to you because you're so focused on the deadline and the job and the creative process and the analysis of what's gone before, the planning ahead. It was, it was a crazy busy job, eight, eight to late most days. And then flying and then being up all night on press checks and all that kind of stuff. So I loved it. Like I was, I was given freedom by a boss who said, your job is to build relationships. I'll take care of anything else. And I had a right hand person to turn to, to help. And we were doing great business with a great team. It was, there was nothing wrong with the equation from what I could see until right. the doctor says, where's your source of stress? I thought it was a source of joy. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Cause I had an ego, yeah. right. But yeah. I'd also been doing some coaching with New Yorkers and one of my favorite lines with New Yorkers who do like to complain, like, let's be honest, New Yorkers have always got something to say, either the traffic or their sister or their family okay. or whatever. Yeah. And my, my line back to them would always be, well, what do you love? I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is going on and this is what's wrong. And it's like, no, no, no. What do you love? And I had to stop and think sometimes. So when I was faced with this decision, like, what do I do about stress? I look at, well, what do I love? And so the decision to move to the West Coast was pretty easy because I got two weeks a year to take off work to go skiing. My favorite place to be is on top of a mountain and skiing. It's so clean and beautiful. And the warmth from the chalet to your cozy coat to racing down the hill, to being with friends, to stopping for beer or coffee or glue vine or whatever. It's, it was beautiful. So I actually took two months. And when I finished my job in New York, I took two months and went to San Francisco or I rented a car and I drove to all the ski resorts that I knew of in, um, in North America. And I knew that I liked Whistler in Canada. I'd skied there before. And I think Telluride was the only other place that I was really tempted to consider making home. But the challenge with Telluride is it's extremely remote. Whereas Vancouver is close to Whistler and we have a pretty good international connection. Now I don't fly very much at all these days, but when I was making the decision in New York, I was in a plane every week. So sure. having a connected hub was important. And, and uh, so if you were doing it for two months, well, did you have a plan for after that? Or you were just like, no. let's see. <laughs> no, the, the plan hatched really when they arrived in, in Whistler, I'd already seen a lot of options, lots of possibilities. So what I had intended to, to do was to create a small cabin hotel in the woods. I have a hospitality background and then I had my corporate 
marketing career. And that didn't go so well. We, we did not succeed with that project. It cost quite a lot of money. I had to sell property to pay my share of debts. And at the time, it was devastating. Mm. But you move on, as one does. Yeah. And um, I think living in nature, in, in the mountains for 10 years, you learn something. You learn something about yourself and your relationship to nature. I rode a bike a lot of places. You hung out with people who are extremely athletic and from many parts of the world and many walks of life but the thread you share in common is the love of skiing and the love of the mountain and the love of the fresh air so my thoughts always go what about money how did you just do that <laughs> like well, I'm I was going, lucky. How, how could you pay for all that you know like that's that's where i'm going i would love to take 10 years off in nature or whatever but yeah be like <laughs> so you adjust you adjust you make choices and i think being in Worcester and being outside i was lucky i had a hospitality background got a job in a nice restaurant and so oh, you'd okay. ski all day and serve at night and people okay. are very generous when on holiday and you know people you are also yeah. i was working and i was a waiter in a nice restaurant so i make nice tips and it was enough to live on and all enough right. to live on through ski season to allow you to live the rest of the year. And uh, I have to say that, you know, we need money to live, but it's not my priority. And I think in listening to, I had my first interaction with First Nations people one-on-one -on -one when I was in Whistler, because the local Squamish people and, and Lillooet people who live north and south of the Whistler village, they used to, in days of old, send a smoke signal up from either village, and then they would walk up to Whistler and meet at Whistler because mm. it was the point at which the rivers flowed both north and south. So it was a meeting place. It became a huge international ski resort. But I think when I saw how the people lived in the Mount Curry uh, village, I realized it's very different to the glamour of Whistler where you have a Four Seasons Hotel and a Fairmont Hotel and all the big chains. And, you know, it's, it's a beautiful place to be and I don't know how it really benefits the First Nations people. It benefits the BC government because they generate revenue from a, a resort like that. And I guess some of those funds go back to you know First Nations neighbors. But what Whistler did, and I was lucky to be a part of, was a, a leadership Sea to Sky program. The, the region is called the Sea to Sky Corridor. So mm -hmm. I was in leadership Sea to Sky program. And there we had First Nations people from both the Squamish and Lillooet. Uh, bands. And um, while I didn't necessarily make close friends with them, I, I heard them. And they had a session where we had the youth of one of the First Nations groups speak to us as a, a cohort, a leadership team learning how to be leaders. And um, they really touched my heart. But I, I heard it from the young people, what it was like for their elders and the young people are assimilated and they have kind of a foot in both camps. They're born in the modern world, the current times, but a lot of their relatives, their aunties and uncles and grandpas and great grandparents went to the residential schools and they didn't talk about the residential schools there. They just, um, they shared what it was like to be there and they were all committed to education and making a difference. So that for me was 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 a, a key spark, and then years later, I I got to live in a village next to a First Nations village where they were kind enough to include non-Indigenous people to walk with them, and that learning scratched the curiosity deeper. And uh, and I ended up reading a lot of books while I was up on the coast. But you ask about money; it's it's tricky. I drive a water taxi now, and I make you know. More, more than minimum wage, but it's not a big salary. It's not what I was making in New York. But I feel more like I'm part of the fabric of the community and, and I connect with locals. The First Nations conversation is not super present in Vancouver, but it is respected. In a lot of meetings that are municipal meetings, they start with a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that we're living on the land of the Squamish, and the Swela Tooth, and I forget the other nation, which is terrible. We'll have to put that in. But there, there are three key nations here. Up the coast, it was the Coast Salish. 
All right, can I ask you a question? So just to set the stage, for me at least, you what kind of leadership um, team were you on? Just at the hotel? Like, or was it, did it involve them already? Well, in Whistler, you know, because I'd worked in a very creative environment in New York, we were, you know, we worked with creative agencies to, to develop concepts. Mm-hmm. I was interested in um, Whistler at the time was, I guess, working on a bid for the 2010 Olympic Games. And I was interested in the arts and I got involved with the Arts Council and I helped them go through a strategic planning process mm-hmm. where they went from being, you know, 13, 13 good-hearted, hard-working board members doing all the work to put on arts events for youth and the community to creating a strategic plan, creating alliances with the key organizations within the resort, and then hiring a staff member and delivering on a five-year vision. So that that was where I was involved as a leader, and I think that's why I participated in that program. So, um, so how did those youth, the indigenous youth, if I'm saying it correctly, happen to be speaking to your group? I think part of the curriculum was self-directed reading and part of it was work days that we had once a month. So one of the work days was with the, the indigenous youth. Um, mm. And it was brilliant because at that time, and I don't think it's, it's not in, in the location they had back then. It may exist somewhere else in Vancouver right now and I'm not aware, but they had a, a, a strong indigenous youth presence at um, a central Vancouver location where, you know, there's some tourism walking by and I think it was called Storium and it was really telling the story of the region. And so the First Nations youth were connected in that. um, So, and then, and then what was the, I mean, because obviously, you know, you're very, um, not involved, what's the word? You're, you know, you're passionate and when did that moment happen? When you, because there you are, you had come from New York, you know, you're working as a writer, whatever. Like, when did you become, I don't know, not enamored, I can't think of the right word, but when did that, like, your heart kind of open and you go, whoa, this is what well, I'm the, about? The opening, the opening photograph on my web page under the First Nations um, section is a photograph of the Kahaman people standing on a dock. And that dock is where children were taken from 50 years ago to residential school. And I had gone out of curiosity being new in the region. I'd heard the truth and reconciliation walk was happening. Or I didn't even get that was the name at the time. I think I just heard there was a walk with the First Nations people. And I was curious and I went along and I listened. And as we walked, they were drumming and they were singing and a lot of non-Indigenous people there and some Indigenous people there. So I walked and chatted with strangers and realized that what we were doing was following the elders of the community who were children taken from the community and we were going to the point from which they were taken and so when i stood on the dock and i saw these you know 70 year old elders they brushed each other with cedar and they honored each other while the drumming and the singing was going on and they cast the cedar branch into the ocean And as they cast the cedar branch into the ocean, they forgave all that was done to them. Wow. Can you imagine being at the point at which you were snatched from your family with with an audience and then forgiving it? It was very impactful. It was very powerful. And it left me hurt and angry and committed to do something. And I didn't know what to do or how to do it. And so I went back the following year for then what I realized was a truth and reconciliation walk. I spent time to read a lot of books. Again, on my webpage, you'll see all those books that I've listed are Mm -hmm. books that I have read out of that curiosity from that moment. Wow. And it was three years later on the third anniversary of the walk that um, the same gentleman, uh, I don't know that I should mention him without his permission, but the same gentleman was speaking to the audience that had gathered and walked. And I just, I was recording sound for somebody else making a documentary of the piece or just recording it for the nation. And I realized 
record it for yourself. And so I just put my phone on my knee and recorded the sound. And they were speaking on a microphone. And so you get the crowd background noise, you get the dog barking, the kids interrupting someone's cell phone, going off all that stuff. But I managed to capture what he shared. And I realized when I got home that I have images to support everything that he has said from both my reading and the photos that I take. I'm a prolific photo taper. I love photography. Most of my photography was, you know, just the joy of being in a, a, a natural spot where the forest, you know, comes up out of the ocean on the mountains as they raise out of the, the Pacific. And these people have lived here for thousands and thousands of years uninterrupted until, you know, less than 200 years ago when some industrialists decided, oh, that's a great place to put a mill. Let's have a paper mill there. And so they dammed the river, they moved the First Nations village, you know, five miles, five miles up the coast. And in damming the river, they stopped the salmon run, but they created a beautiful lake. And so, you know, that region is known for lakes, but it doesn't really acknowledge the fact that the people got moved. Not only did they get moved, but for four generations, the children got taken away. Five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds taken every year. September, there was the roundup. And, uh, it's harrowing, but I, I can't claim to have this all be an accidental discovery. When I first moved to Vancouver in 1999 from New York, yeah. I met a young indigenous man who at the time was, was, was in recovery from alcoholism and he's clean and sober now and he's extremely well educated, but he's a kid that was taken from his family. There was something that was called the 60s scoop in Canada. It meant that after the residential school chapter stopped, so when they took the children away, they took them a long way away from their families so that they couldn't run away or couldn't have accidental meetings with their community. They were forced to speak English. They were taught history from a settler's point of view. They were, their culture was banned. The, it, it, it's horrible what we did to reprogram that the strategy of, at the time, and it was declared by the prime minister of Canada back then, was to remove the Indian from the child. And where do they the, live? Like the child. Who they got, the kids? They got taken from their village and yeah. they were then housed in residential schools in remote places. They were, some will argue that they were put into slavery because they had to work the gardens, they had to clean the place, they had to do the work, and then they were tortured and beaten and raped oh. and brutal. It's been, it's been termed a genocide. And now in Canada, we have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I think they started in the 80s, but we're now really seeing, you know, actions coming to light. Canada, um, almost 18 months ago, adopted the United Nations Declarations of Rights for Indigenous People. That is now in law here in Canada. And that's an international mandate to have Indigenous people be recognized, included, and treated equally. Now, it's crazy. They got the reading that I did. Chelsea Val is a very well-educated, she's a mom, she's a lawyer, She's an activist. She is First Nations. And her book is harrowing. It's been banned in some parts of the U.S., from what I understand, because it tells the truth. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's an educational tool. But when you read through it, what they want is self-governance and self-education, the right to self-determine. But I was saying that, you know, John, my, my friend Jonathan was removed from his family and adopted into a Catholic family. So you could argue in some ways he's privileged. Right, because he got an education in a, in a Catholic family, mm -hmm. as opposed to being raised with his people that were still broken from the residential school chapters, from their people who struggled with alcoholism and drug addiction and disjointedness. There's a wonderful film that was made that um, I don't remember the title. It's, it's again, it's on my web page, but it talks of Phyllis, who started the Orange Shirt movement. She was a child that was sent to residential school. And her grandma gave her an orange shirt to go off to school with. And her first day at school, the orange shirt was taken away because all their personal possessions were stripped from them and they were put into, you know, a uniform at the school. And her way of bringing attention in this truth and reconciliation chapter was to start the orange shirt movement. And you'll see at Truth and Reconciliation Works in Canada, everyone's wearing orange. All right. So you, you get the power of the shirt 
And as more and more non-Indigenous people become aware of what really happened, we have an opportunity to, to really wonder, well, what, what can we do? How do we help here? It's so wrong. Can you imagine someone knocking on your door and then taking your children away? And when they come back, they speak a different language and they have no knowledge of your culture. Ten years later. No. <laughs> That's seen as terrible. And did they know that this was going to happen so they could like hide their kids or something? Or it was just... There are, yeah, there are stories of all of that. So like the, the, the annual roundup was in September, but one of the four generations, Hillary. That's a long time. So imagine you're a grandma, you went, you know what's coming, you right. know that your kid is going to be whipped off to this place, and then your kid comes back and has children, and they're getting whipped away. In the in the film about Phyllis, the, the founder of the Orange Shirt Movement, her I think her mother or grandmother says, I stopped holding my children when they were two, so the separation wouldn't be so hard. Uh, but when did they get to go back? They went, they either ran away and some didn't survive the running away because it was deliberately difficult to do. Some went back. I know one of the, the stories in the village that I was a neighbor to, one of the kids came back and they sat on the doorstep of their home, not sure what to do. And in the morning, you know, one of the adults in the home realized they were sitting there and they bring them back in. But it's a long process. Like today, the biggest challenge, I think, in um, you know, First Nations community is the mental health. It's it's a multi generational trauma that is embedded within them and their culture. And people like Chelsea Val, the writer of um, the book that I started with, um, you know, just I forgot what I was going to say, but but she she she's been an advocate for it. I, I lost I lost my thread there. I'm sorry. I was I was going somewhere and... about the. Four generations, the orange. Four shirt. generations of trauma. Yeah, yeah, it'll it'll come to me again. But she she is a brilliant woman, a brilliant writer, and a brilliant activist. And interestingly enough, this last week, there's an artist who Kent Monkman. He is a, um, I'm guessing he's forties, fifties year year old. I'm not exactly sure of his age, but he has painted massive pieces. You know, like. 20 feet by 15 feet canvases that are kind of um, landscape pieces, but they include indigenous history. And he has an alter ego, Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. And he tells the story of the original, the or origination of his name. And his alter ego is this very glamorous, um, I don't know how to say it correctly, but a, a, a cross-dressing man expressing oh. himself as his feminine side. And when he spoke in the theater last week, he really spoke from a position of representing everybody. Like he acknowledges the world that we live in today and he and he tells the story. But there are two books. I'm, I, I couldn't help but buy them. Like, I'm going to do a little plug here. Like, this mm. is, which way do I go this way? It's Miss, Miss Chief. Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. So this is the memoirs, volume one. And then there's the memoirs, volume two. Wow. Right. Yeah. wow. Right. So you can see his naked butt right there in the in in, in oh, this cover yeah. image, which is one of his paintings. Oh, with the high heel. I recommend anyone interested in the re truth and reconciliation conversation to look at, you know, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which is the most serious side of the recovery. But I think Kent Monkman tells the stories with a little bit of tongue in cheek, a little bit of humor, a little bit of humanity, which makes it easier to digest. A lot of us settlers, it took me a while to accept that I am a settler and I'm definitely a settler. I came in 1992 for a corporate job that was supposed to be a three year contract that turned into almost well, 30 years. And I'm grateful, I'm so grateful. Like I fell in love with Canada in the wilderness I know the moment that it happened, we were camping and I was on a lake and a boat looking up at the stars and you could see other un universes with your naked eye. There was not an electric light bulb for mm. hundreds of miles. Beautiful, so beautiful. And my love of the mountains comes from the same thing. Living on the coast where I was up the coast, I was drawn to the nature, but it was the people that I discovered. It was the people who really touched my heart, walking with 
the nation, hearing their stories, attending a, a, a poll ceremony. They, they, they had two poles carved by a neighboring um, nation across the way. And some of their community worked with the neighboring community and together they, they had these two poles. One is remember, and the other is welcome. Sure. And being there was wonderful. I was lucky enough to be asked to help roll them over when they were almost finished. And so I had my face, I don't know, there were 10 guys rolling this giant log over. You could see that it was carved and almost ready, but the raven nose had to go on. The paddler's arms had to go on. The paddle had to go into his arms. The, the beauty in the poles and the detail in the poles is just ridiculous. You can see First Nations art behind me. To me, it, yeah. it's, it's nature reflected through a human's ability to relate to it. Wow. Right. Well, let's take our little commercial break and then sure. we will come back. We need to thank our sponsor and then we'll be back um, and hear more about the First Nations. Has social emotional learning become just one more thing on your teacher's plates? Do teachers and students both find it boring and ineffective? Then bring Kikori to your school. Kikori transforms classrooms through experiential SEL activities that help students play, reflect, connect, and grow. Even better, students say it's more fun than recess. Schedule a no obligation conversation at kikoriapp.com slash bring Kikori. K-I-K-O-R-I. Do you ever feel like you can't say what you really want to say? Or that you're stuck or in a holding pattern in your relationships, career, personal life, or finances? Are there things you want in life that you've given up on? Are you resigned that this is as good as it's going to get? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then Hillary Burns, host of the Getting Real with Hillary show, has the solution you need. Hillary is a published author of three books and has a program called The Getting Real Process. This process frees you from what is holding you back, allowing you to create a life you love. Don't believe it? It is hard to believe that it could work, isn't it? The proof is that hundreds of Hillary's clients have used The Getting Real Process and are now free to create whatever they want in relationships, career, finances, enjoying life, or just loving themselves more. So go to realtalkwithhillary.com and order Hillary's book, Real Talk, and set up a conversation. So as always, thank you to our sponsor, KokoriApp.com. Uh, if you want to bring experiential social emotional learning to your children at schools, please contact them. Go to kokoriapp.com and uh, schedule a time to talk with them. It really does make a huge difference socially for your children. And um, we are ready to bring John Hewson back. So welcome back, John. So. Hello so there's, I mean, there's so much, and I think what I'm so, I guess, interested, moved, you know, is just your commitment to this, that you are so, you know, I mean, you were from the other, you know, you were from the UK, you weren't even from, you know, North America or whatever, but here you have just fallen in love with these people and their story and you know, making it right. And, you know, what I'm thinking is the people that took the kids, um, obviously they were in a different conversation and they were thinking for whatever effed up reason that they were doing the right thing, you know, and I guess, you know, it's like any atrocity or any, um, you know, look at slavery or look at, you know, what's going on in Israel. And, you know, both sides seem to think that they're right. You know, obviously, mm -hmm. you're taking someone's children. You must think that what you're doing is okay. You know, is there anything about 
that, like the other side and, and what, you know, obviously for the people whose children were taken and to the children that were taken, I, I can't even imagine, but what, you know, when does, when do they look at it from a different perspective? When, when do they realize, oh, we got to stop taking these kids? Like, when did that happen or does it still happen? When did that stop? Do you know? Well, it has stopped. I think the last residential school closed in 1996 or something, but the, the chapter of the more aggressive strategy to put the kids into the school was in the 80s. And I think the prime minister of Canada at the time you know, made an apology. Mm. But it's taken a long time for action to really happen. It's the people like Chelsea Val. So Chelsea Val, I don't know her personally, so this is what I read and understood and remember, but, you know, she is a young Indigenous person who did not go into the residential school system. Okay. So she was able to go and educate herself, become a lawyer, you know, almost play the, the settler's game of, of, of getting recognized qualifications so that people would listen and take us seriously. I don't know if that was her motive, but that's kind of how I imagine it, 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 it happened. But now people like her who are educated are fighting for the welfare system that works for First Nations people. We went from the residential schools, we went to the 60s scoop kid, and then we now, now there's more indigenous kids in foster care than any other, than all the other um, cultural kids in the system. So we're Why? still not it right because the families are broken, the structures no. are broken at home and we haven't gone back to help the, the the communities work together. We are now, it's happening. Like in the nation where, who are my neighbors up on the coast here, the Coast Salish people, the biggest issue is mental health. How do we help people recover from multi-generational trauma? I think it's Murray Sinclair was the the the, the judge or, or, or the person who led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report to Canada that has led to a lot of these changes. And there are 96 recommendations that come out of that report that are the way forward. And when you walk with real people side by side, they're looking to share so that we can find a good way forward together. So, you know, Chelsea's advocating for that, but at the same time, we've got to let the First Nations people lead and let them with their hearts, their knowledge, their tradition, their ancestral wisdom, allow them to design solutions that work for their people. It's not our job as the settlers to do that. It's not our job really to step in and help or tell them anything in, in line with what to do. They know. They lived here for thousands and thousands of years without our help, right? Help, I say. Like we came out of curiosity. You asked me about, you know, my roots. Like I'm, I'm born into a military religious family. My grandfather was a, you know, a, a country vicar in a beautiful church in a beautiful stone village in England. He served in the war. He, he read prayers to the boys going to their death at, at some of the beach wars. Like I don't, I'm not a, a war historian, but I mean, it, it's, he, he went through some pretty, harrowing stuff but he believed in god and christianity and i was sent to a school that reinforced that and as a kid i just wanted to get out of it forced church every sunday and two or three times a week and you know part of our morning assembly was a, a church-based prayer and welcome like god was a major part of it all but you you, you kind of question god when we're going to war and mm. our faith and the things that we do Eddie Izzard is a British comedian. He's a funny guy, but he does a skit where he shows, he, he plays a character showing up on the shores of North America and say, I've got a flag. I claim this in the name of the king. <laughs> That's our land. Well, you haven't got a flag. Well, if you haven't got a flag, you can't have it. It's ours. We've got the flag. We're claiming it for our king. And it wasn't quite like that, but it kind of like that. I and mean, colonialism has come out of many European countries, one of which is England. France, Holland, England fought for Canada and North America. Early settlers came on boats that could cross over from Europe into the, you know, Northeast uh, North America. And we came in that way. Belgium, Germany, Spain, Portugal, all did their bit traveling around the world and claiming lands. It was, 
as a kid, I was inspired by those that got on a ship and traveled somewhere and brought back stories and riches. I guess very romantic. Mm -hmm. Oh, we found bananas, we found coffee, we found coconuts. You know, nowadays we're all guilty. We all carry a phone and in the phone is, is medals from the Congo where there's horrible wars going on. We're all guilty, but we don't think about it. We don't make that connection between our personal actions. We all live on stolen land. The land was claimed by early, early settlers. We brought our laws to govern the indigenous people. At first, they were friends, they were guides, they were welcoming, there was curiosity. There was a lot of, I think, marriages and families that got bridged. You know, the European settlers met local indigenous people. It's beautiful, it's romantic, it's different. And it was discovering at first, it was friendly. At first, the indigenous person was a vital guide to survival in North America, these strange and different lands. The, dis the, the explorers were looking for passages to go through the north, west passages to go across the top of Canada or to go through, they built the Panama Canal because you had to go all the way around the bottom of South America on a boat and there was no radar. <laughs> there was no modern facilities. They were in a wooden right. boat with a sail saying a prayer to God every day that they would make it another day at sea, that they wouldn't die of hunger or disease or shipwreck, right? It was intrepid people going out there and, but it changed. It changed from being a warm friendship to one of then uh, dominating. It became about the trade, the fur trade. It, it then became other industry. Oh, we realize, oh, we want these prime pieces of real estate for ourselves. Let's push the indigenous people further away. Treaties got written where we were supposed to honor agreements that said, oh, we'll take this piece of land. You can have that piece of land. You have all the rights you need up there. And we'll manage ourselves over here. And then, you know, the settler, um, ways dominated all of it. And a lot of the agreements were not honored with the First Nations people in the US and in Canada and most um, colonial nations around the world because it was about trade and profit. Then became industry, took over. We need more beaver pelts. And beaver pelts were put on a hat to make your hat look beautiful. Mm. So we killed beavers to have a fashionable hat. <laughs> So, but how, you know, if they were friends and, you know, first, thing, so they helped them and then all of a sudden they didn't need them anymore. Like, why I would they? There were partnerships at first. Yeah. So and I how think... did it switch? Do you think they were in their way or do you think it was just greed? No, I mean, sorry, it's, greed. It's, it's greed. And then. I think what you will find is that those that had the lived experience of being an early settler, they went through real hard, hardship. That was not an easy thing. Even I think you can look at our grandparents. If you look back at our grandparents that were right. settlers, if they came, they might've got a piece of land like in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, it's big, open, rich farmland, mm -hmm. but it's hard work. If there's no farm there and you're going to turn, you know, countryside into wilderness, into a farm, that takes a lot of work. So people work really hard to survive winter and to provide yeah. enough food to get through and then to provide more for the industry machine that fed the rest of Canada and the rest of the world. Um, trade has taken over and it, and it leads to questions. Like if you, you know, look a little bit beyond the, you know, the impact on the First Nations people, Murray Sinclair, who was the, um, I think the chair of that report that got submitted and accepted and became the foundation for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he said it's going to take seven generations to repair the damage. Wow. Seven generations. That's a long time. But that's not instant. And we're used to instant, yeah. like instant in our phone, you know, yeah. everything. It's like everything could be delivered now the next day, but it's, it's the healing process. And we've all got healing to do, Hillary, because if you think about it, for all the settlers that came here, they were getting away from something or coming in hope of creating something. And for those that are third, fourth, fifth, 10 generate, 10th generation American or 10th generation Canadian, we feel that this is our home. We, we have rights to be here. Yeah, maybe because you were born here, but what about the people who got displaced for you to live where you live? How are they being cared for now? And how, I mean, obviously it seems like the settlers were the bullies how why could they 
I mean, how could how could that happen? How could they let it happen? They couldn't fight, you know, like, or it was just kind of, maybe it was, um, you know, happened slowly that they get pushed out, you know, like how, you know, here they are friends, everyone's friends working together. And then all of a sudden, boom, they're stealing their kids. Like how, or, or was it just a gradual, you know, I think it's a gradual thing. I, I don't know my history well enough. I read a lot. Mm-hmm. And I have to say a lot of it is disturbing because of what happened. But I think there were genuine friendships. Like the the Métis uh, First Nations people are the, the cross or, or the union of the early French settlers and the, the First Nations people. There was a lot of a, a, new, a new breed of First Nations person was born because this European blending created a new oh. sort of tribe or, or, or category of, of people and a, and a culture that goes with it. And they're generally, still today, Métis people are often French-speaking as well as English-speaking. Many of them will speak Cree or you know other languages that are their, of their, na- their, their native origin. Mm. So how did it turn? I think it turned because of greed. Yeah. Europe wanted more furs. You know, they, they wanted more trade lumber, natural resources. Um, and then once the settlers come, they're focused on themselves. Right. In, in the collection of books on, on my webpage, there's, there's a, um, let me just look, look for the correct name because um, it's a beautiful book. It's, a, um, it's called This Place, 150 Years Retold. And it's an illustrated book. There are 10 um, enlightened stories that are from indigenous writers, and then they have been illustrated by indigenous artists as well. Mm. It tells the history from the point of view of the First Nations people. History is usually told from the point of view of the victor, right? He who wins gets to tell the story. Mm. So it's very interesting, and it's and there's something that is really quite amazing with the First Nations people is that they have a sense of humor, right? How do you have a sense of humor after all of that? And yet they will share with you with kindness and generosity. Hmm. At, the, at the occasion where the, the pole raising happened, I, I went to the beach to watch the poles go up. And during the ceremony, we were invited to go and have lunch afterwards. I'm curious, I went, and the generosity at that lunch was beautiful. The two neighboring nations that had carved the poles came together. They were drumming and singing, and the kids were involved. And right there, at the table where I was sitting, was the elder who had walked, had led the walk to the dock where he was taken from. So to listen to him sharing stories over lunch, to see the neighboring nation sing and celebrate the making of the poles to have the the receiving nation celebrate and then the kids dance dances that had never been seen by anyone in the room before because they'd been lost so the kids are now embracing their culture beginning to learn how to be a coast salish person the languages are being restored there are people who there's a handful of people left who speak the languages from it being passed down to them. So now it's a very deliberate attempt to preserve languages. And last I heard the Klahaman language is, is um, Ayajutam. And I think there were like eight natural speakers left. And now there, there's movement within the community to bring it alive and the kids are learning and the non-indigenous kids are learning, wow. right? So it's in the schools. And so going from the country to the city is very different because we, in the city here, we don't, there's one, there's way more people, but the indigenous people are not as integrated into the main part of, you know, certainly downtown Vancouver, where we see them is on the streets with addiction issues. We don't, we don't get to interact mm. with that cultural recovery. So the perspective is different. And one of the kids right. of a friend of mine here in the city goes, we're tired of this. We get this every year. We get the same story taught to us every year. So the creativity in educating kids is lost. They're just telling the story over again. So they're like going over their heads. They're closing it out. Whereas when you meet people face to face, yeah, and you 
you see these young kids dancing these dances that haven't been seen by anyone in the room before, it's very heartwarming. And I was taking oh, photographs yeah. during that session and Elder touches me on the shoulder and says, get up and dance, come yeah. join in. I down with him afterwards and says, well, I'm so sorry for what our people did, what can I do? And you know what he says? Yeah. Keep coming and bring your friends. Oh. So, all right, so on that note, um, I just want you to have time to be able to tell people, you know, if they want to do something or if they want to, you know, your your website, you say what it is because I have it buried. I, I want people <laughs> to be able to go and, and, you know, if they're moved by this and they want to learn more or they want to go, you know, how would they do this so that they can, you know, maybe find their passion and their purpose as well, like you have. Um. Well, I think you and I have connected through the Conference for Global Transformation. Yeah. And it was for that event that I wrote the first paper. I wrote a paper that was about my experience of walking with the First Nations people, following the elder to the dockside from where he was taken from. And in the writing of that, there were 36 endnotes like references, because I made statements in there like it was a genocide. The editor goes, no, you can't use that word. And I'm like, well, yeah, you can. It's actually in the official document from the government in the first paragraph that summarizes a 7,000 page report. It's a genocide, right? So yeah, we're going to call it a genocide. It's a genocide. We try to eliminate thousands of people, right? So it's a genocide. Let, let's just get straight with that. And so with those references, I realized no one's going to read those. And so I created the web page and it's called bobbc.ca. So B O B B C dot C A. We're in Canada. So we end our URLs with a dot C A rather than a dot com or a dot whatever. Right. So, okay. but it's, and Bob BC stands for the best of beautiful British Columbia, which is where yeah. I live. And so you'll see on them, uh, uh, there's some, uh, there's some nature photography, there's some food stuff. I love food art, nature and i'm so committed to this first nations that i created a separate page in there and it's a long scrolling page i'm not a professional web developer but there are lots of resources okay and i think when you look there you'll find the original paper there was a film that i made a year ago that isn't there yet and we're waiting for permission from the nation to share it there are two levels of permission that we're waiting on one is the storyteller who led that walk having his permission to tell his story mm -hmm. it's his to share not mine right right but he shared it publicly and i captured it in a public environment so i'm hoping that he says yes okay but also because i shot photos and film over three years it wasn't a planned documentary it was an accidental documentary i realized i had the tools to illustrate something that film i hope will be added there it's not there yet because we're waiting so many of their community is seen in it that we need their blessing so okay. that's a problem will take some time, but on there, you will find key documents for Canada. You'll find reading videos, like there's a lot of resources. You'll see the link to Kent Monkman's work, okay. who is the artist I mentioned, who's funny and, and um, I don't want to spoil it for you, but it, it's not necessarily PC okay. and it's not necessarily um, for, for kids other than they will learn and they will remember from his art. I missed it when the, his art was on tour and came to the Museum of Anthropology here in Vancouver, sadly. But I would go to Ottawa to see his work. And the Denver Museum has the key piece that was included in my paper, which is a massive painting of children being ripped from their parents' arms by oh. priests, nuns, and the Royal Canadian Mounting Police. All right. And, okay. And so what would you want to leave people with? Like, what would be your vision? you know, five years from now or 10, what is your hope and prayer for the world, for the First Nations people that you are, you know? Worldwide is a bit harder to, to say, but I would love that all people are treated equally, that the First Nations are treated with the respect that they deserve. We live on their land. We live on their land that was stolen from them. We should not be treating them like second-class citizens. We should be treating them with dignity and respect it's, it's it, to me, equality is the beginning place. Okay. They, they're ahead of us. They have knowledge within them and their communities 
let alone the disruption that we that we that we've done to their lives, but their knowledge of survival mm. over time. I think if we if we as settlers had followed more of the First Nations wisdom, the world would not be in the place it is today, where we have these terrible climate change realities that we have to face. So I would say I would love for people to know whose land you live on, to acknowledge the land that you live on when you speak and you share with people, right? And um, I think Ch Chelsea Val says that everyone should read the summary of the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's a tricky document to read. It's a tough document to read. Mm. But if you're up for it, read it. But you should at least know what the 64 recommendations are from that so that you can see what is the bridge that has been recommended? That Truth and Reconciliation Commission really worked with the indigenous people to figure out how do we make this good again? And it's taking a long time. Yeah. And if you're not familiar with UNDRIP, which is the United Nations Declaration of Rights for Indigenous People, then take a look because it speaks to how we work, again, at building the bridge, at respecting and acknowledging the people who so much has happened to them. Yeah, well, thank you, John. I appreciate your passion and what you're doing and your commitment and your courage, you know, to uh, change your life and make a difference. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anything in closing as we're running out of time? <laughs> Any last words? I think um, go to the web page because it's, it's all there. But um, just to acknowledge the First Nations people is all we can really do. That it, it can be done through art, like you see behind me. I don't know which way to point my finger, but up here. And um, there are many ways you, you you can get interested. Don't go to their rescue. They don't need rescuing. They just need to know you care. They need to know you're there. And like the elder said to me when I said, what can I do? He says, come back, bring your friends. Mm -hmm. So just be interested and be curious and accept the invitation when they invite you to participate. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been great having you. Thank you for your time and interest, Hillary, and, all, and for all that you do. You're welcome. Thank you for watching this episode. I started getting real with Hillary when I discovered that I was a people-pleasing, pleasant phony and wanted to be more of my real self. We can grow together if you will like the show, subscribe to my channel, and share this episode with your friends and family so that we can have a world that's more real.